Thank you for joining us this hour. You're watching The World Today on Channels Television. I'm Anne Mwawadu. Coming up on the program. Three killed in the shooting at a luxury shopping centre in Bangkok. Former U.S. President Donald Trump appears in court over accusations he lied about the size of his real estate empire in order to access loans. Plus, 29 Nigerian soldiers killed by insurgents near the border with Mali in what is considered the country's worst jihadist attack yet. We begin the show today with a shooting at a shopping mall in Bangkok, the Thai capital. Police have already had this person in custody, a 14-year-old boy who attends a school not far from the mall. It is still unclear why he carried out that attack. The shooting happened at the CM Paragon Shopping Center, an upmarket destination in Bangkok. Three people were initially said to have been killed, but later authorities updated the figure to two. Shoppers flee in the CM Paragon shopping mall in Bangkok upon hearing gunshots. Social media videos show scenes of chaos with people, including children, running out of the doors of the mall while security guards usher them out. As the deadly shooting unfolded, an eyewitness says she heard gunshots and saw people running. We, we see all the people run, run, run. We don't understand why it happened. And so we go after them. And after that, we hear a, sh a shot, very shot. Thai police say about two people have been killed and five others wounded, including a foreign national at the mall, best known in the capital, and is popular with locals and tourists. The center was quickly evacuated and had its doors closed following the incident. Siam Metro Station, located opposite the mall, was also shot. The gunman, a 14-year-old boy, has been arrested and is being questioned by police. Emergency services shared an image of a police officer apprehending and handcuffing an individual laying face down on the floor of Siam Paragon Mall. The boy is said to have surrendered on the third floor. His motive remains unclear. Mall goers and bystanders express their shock after the gunman's arrest, with a crowd of shoppers and curious bystanders gathering around one of the entrances after the suspect was taken into custody. Prime Minister Sreta Tavisin has sent his condolences to the families of victims. Mass shootings in Thailand are rare, although Gone ownership rates are relatively high for the region. Let's turn our attention to India now, where police have raided the homes of several of the country's prominent journalists and authors over their connection with an investigation into the funding of news website NewsClick. Earlier today, police seized mobile phones and laptops of those raided. Among them, NewsClick editor Prabir Pokhar Satya. Journalist Abishar Shama, Paranjoy Guha, Takura Anandio, and Basha Singh, popular satirist Sanjay Rajura, and historian Sohail Hashimi. Some of them have been taken to the police station for questioning. Searches were also being conducted at the website's offices in Delhi. Officials are investigating allegations that NewsClick got illegal funds from China but NewsClick has denied the charges. The coordinated raids taking place in 30 locations are some of the largest and most extensive on India's media in recent years. But opposition leaders are saying that it is a Bharatiya Janta Party government's fresh attack on the media. Meanwhile, the row between India and Canada is still going on. As India tells Canada, it must repatriate 41 diplomats by October the 10th. Relations between both countries have been strained since Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced the suspicion over India's involvement in the murder of Singh separatist leader Hadrip Nijar. To India, Nijar is a terrorist because of his advocacy for Khalistan, which is an independent Sikh state. 
It's an allegation that India has dismissed and called absurd. In any case, the Financial Times is reporting India has threatened to revoke the diplomatic immunity of Canadian diplomats it has told to leave if they remained after the October the 10th. Canada has 62 diplomats in India, and India says the total should be reduced by 41. There has been no confirmation nor any denial from foreign ministries of either countries about this report. And happening in India's neighbor, Nepal, hit by a 6.3 and 5.3 magnitude earthquake, one person has been confirmed injured, but there is still no damage to homes and a landslide blocking a major highway. Tremors were also felt all the way in New Delhi. Authorities in the Hamalian Nations district of Bajang say that quakes set off a landslide that blocked a major highway to the southern plains. The one injury was caused by a falling object. As we mentioned earlier, the tremor was felt in India, causing people to rush out of their homes and office blocks. There were no immediate reports of damage. Scientists Pierre Agostini, Efrenet Caruz, also Anne Lahirlier, where have now won the 2023 Nobel Prize in Physics for creating incredibly short pulses of light that could capture processes inside atoms and molecules in work, which could also advance medical diagnostics and electronics. According to the Nobel Academy, their studies have given humanity new tools for exploring the movement of electrons inside atoms where changes occur in a few tenths of uh, an attosecond, well, which is a unit so short that there are actually as many attoseconds in one second as there have been seconds since the birth of the universe. Only the fifth woman to win a Nobel Physics Prize Anne works at Lund University in Sweden, and Agostini is a professor at Ohio State University in the United States. Anne discovered a new effect from the interaction of laser light with atoms in a gas in experiments beginning in the 1980s. For Agostini and uh, Krauss, they demonstrated how this could be used to create shorter light pulses than previously possible. of Sciences has decided to award the 2023 Nobel Prize in Physics in equal shares to Pierre Agostini, the Ohio State University, USA, Ferenc Krauss, Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optik, Karsching, and Ludwig, Ludwig Maximilians Universität München, Germany, and Anne Lier, Lund University, Sweden for experimental methods that generate attosecond pulses of light for the study of electron dynamics in matter. Let's head over to the United States where we saw the flooding of New York City on Friday. Here's what neighboring New Jersey also looks like. Months worth of torrential downpour came in just hours flooding the city. This video footage showed a police officer rescuing a trapped motorist from a flooded parking lot. But police in New Jersey warned motorists to take the flooding very seriously and not to drive into flooded waters or even around barricades. The deluge also flowed a bout of heavy downpours and strong winds the previous weekend from remnants of tropical storm Ophelia. I'll talk more about weather events in other parts of the world, but let's turn our attention now to the former U.S. President Donald Trump, who on Monday verbally attacked New York's attorney general and judge overseeing his civil fraud trial as it began. Mr. Trump is accused of generating more than $100 million by lying about his real estate empire. 
Attorney General Letitia James is seeking at least 250 million U.S. dollars in fines, which is a permanent ban against Mr. Trump and his sons, Donald Trump Jr. and Eric, from running businesses in New York, and a five-year commercial real estate ban against Mr. Trump and the Trump Organization. Mr. Trump's election campaign used the start of the trial for fundraising, saying he was defending his family and reputation from New York Democrats it called corrupt tyrants. The case concerns accusations by the Attorney General that Mr. Trump inflated his assets and his own net worth from 2011 to 2021 to obtain favorable bank loans and lower insurance premiums. Mr. James has accused Mr. Trump of materially overhauling assets, including his Trump Tower penthouse apartment in Manhattan, his Mar-a-Lago estate in Florida, and various office towers and golf clubs, and inflated his own fortune by as much as $2.2 billion dollars. Our VOA's White House Bureau Chief Patsy joins us now. Thank you very much for joining us on the world today. Patsy, it's good to see you. My pleasure. All right, here's uh, what was the former president's defiance in face of these accusations, but we should give him some credit, shouldn't we, at least for showing up in court? Yes, you're absolutely right. There is no requirement for former President Donald Trump to show up in court, but he did. He did yesterday and also today. And if we want to look at the uh, speculation as to why he would do it. I think you mentioned it in your uh, earlier readout of the case, which is that his campaign is fundraising of the case. Uh, President Donald Trump, former President Donald Trump, has long said that this is all part of a witch hunt and what he calls election interference. Uh, of course, Trump is uh, involved in not just a case in New York about his business practices and accounting practices, but also three other uh, major uh, cases, uh, a total of 91 felony charges. And even though the federal charges against him, uh, one for uh, trying to overturn election victory by uh, um, Joe Biden in 2020, as well as the classified documents that he allegedly brought home to him to his residence in Mar-a-Lago, Florida, as well as another state court in, um, in Georgia, there's no connection between uh, federal charges and state charges in the American system. There's no coordination between you know, the U.S. Uh, uh, Attorney General and Letitia James, for example. But yet, this is still something that Donald Trump is trying to sell to his uh, supporters, that this is all part of a witch hunt. And I think another reason why uh, Trump might be choosing to go to New York to attend his trials is because this is such an important issue for him, his business um, credibility is, uh, is such a big part of his persona uh, so that, you know, my colleagues who are reporting on this more closely than I am are saying that this is something that Trump is very concerned with and that's why he wants to be there. But Mr. Trump has deflected the accusation about the size of his property. Instead, he has blamed his lawyer. And I believe at the times of the procurement of these loans saying that he was in charge of handling the paperwork. Does this have any weight in court at all? The proceedings has just started, but one thing that we need to remember is that the judge has already found him to be guilty of fraud, of business fraud. So what is going on right now is not to determine whether he's guilty or not guilty. He's already been found guilty by Judge Engeron. And so now the proceedings is just to determine the liability and also the penalty. As you mentioned, uh, Leticia James, the New York Attorney General, is seeking $250 million plus for Trump and Trump organization. Part of New York obviously carries much larger uh, penalty for Trump and the Trump organization. Um, whether or not that argument will carry weight, um, we, that remains to be seen in terms of you know lowering the penalty or, or how much uh, would the judge um, make Donald Trump pay for for this case. But one other thing that I would underline here is also that it's very clear that it's going to be a very contentious case. Uh, one argument that the Trump lawyers are underlining is that, you know, these valuations are by nature subjective because real estate is subjective. The Trump name is also very highly valued. So, you know, all of these arguments, they are in, in court next 
public speech. All right, but Mr. Trump also complained about not having a jury, even though his attorneys acting on his behalf waived his right to the jury trial earlier this year. Can anything be done about that now? Yeah, so this is an interesting case because the uh, judge, or the attorney general rather, filed it under New York's uh, Consumer Protection Statute, which is a case that is uh, um, waived or that denies the right to a jury. So there was A, it was filed under a situation where there is no jury, uh, and then B, also because his lawyers did not push for it, as you have said yourself. But, you know, it also is a, a question mark whether or not a jury would be helpful to Trump's case because, you know, this is New York, a very liberal uh, state. So it would be very hard for the Trump team to be able to find a set of juries or to be able to agree on a set of juries that could be sympathetic to his case. So this, all of this is also part of, you know, this, this kind of strategy from the Trump ca uh, camp to delay proceedings as much as possible for whatever argument that may stick uh, as they continue to go into this uh, to this case for the next uh, at least two months, according to the judge. Well, Patsy, anyone would ask why are Mr. Trump's sons, Donald Trump, uh, the junior, and Eric not appearing in court with their father? I mean, they have also been accused of inflating his net worth. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good question. I mean, I don't know the answer to that question. Again, the same um, position as Donald Trump, right? They none of them are required to appear in court. Why does Donald Trump choose to appear in court and not his sons? I don't have uh, any good information for you on that. However, having said that, his sons and also other family members have really taken on to social media, waging a campaign against the judge, against the district attorney, against the American, uh, you know, the, the New York legal system, as well as the uh, American legal system, creating this narrative that it really is Joe Biden's administration trying to weaponize uh, a political opponent. As you know, Donald Trump will be running again in 2024, and he seems to be right now leading in the uh, uh, Republican primary um, compared to other um, uh, hopefuls, including Ron DeSantis from Florida, uh, Governor of Florida, and. But how long? Uh Okay, Patsy, how long do you think a trial like this can last? And would it affect Mr. Trump's presidential bid in any way? We don't know how long the trial will last. We just know that the judge said that uh, he expects it to last uh, beyond uh, December, beyond Christmas. Uh, and again, even if this case is settled quickly, there are still three other cases that could drag on for a long time, well into the uh, campaign season that starts, you know, officially in, in January or February with Iowa. So it's going to be a rocky couple of months. And then even though right now Donald Trump is leading in the pack of Republican hopefuls, there's also a big question of whether, you know, he will eventually be bogged down by all of these uh, criminal cases, because obviously it takes a lot of focus and, you know, camp between campaigning and dealing with these Four cases, 91 felonies total. It's it's a lot, so we'll see what happens. All right, thank you very much. VOA's White House Bureau Chief Patsy Wudakuswara, thanks for your contribution on the world today. My pleasure. Former federal prosecutor, West Coast trial lawyers, President Neema Rahmani has said the civil fraud trial against the former U.S. President Donald Trump shows that Mr. Trump is a scam. He was making his remarks during an interview on television saying, even though the case is just about money, it is still important to former president's reputation. He also says that if former president Trump testifies, it may come into evidence in criminal cases as well. In the meantime, in the U.S. House of Representatives, the Speaker, Kevin McCarthy, faced a direct threat to his leadership when Harline Rello, Republican Representative Matt Gates, called for a vote to oust him, injecting an additional element of chaos into Congress. Gates, who has clashed with McCarthy for months now, said that he was, a file, he was filing a motion to vacate that would force a vote to remove McCarthy as Speaker though he has not floated an alternative leader for the chamber. It is still not clear whether he will succeed, but Republicans control the chamber 
by a narrow 221 to 212 majority, and it will take just a few as few defections to threaten McCarthy's hold on power if all Democrats vote, vote against him. Gates and other far-right Republicans are angered that McCarthy relied on Democratic votes to pass a temporary funding extension on Saturday that headed off a partial government shutdown. A faction of about 20 Republicans, Gates included, had forced McCarthy's hand by repeatedly blocking other legislation. But McCarthy has now called Gates' leadership challenge disruptive and has said he expects he will survive. I think the die is cast based on the motion I just filed. I think the time for that discussion would have been over the last several weeks. But instead, we, we saw the speaker continuing. To, I mean, the speaker did not just fail to remediate the breach of the agreement with the, he made with us in January. He accelerated the instances of breach. Like, after I laid out the breach, he went and violated the 72-hour rule. After I laid out the breach, he violated the 100 million uh, no amendment suspension rule. So he, he seems to, to be reverting to the very unfortunate muscle memory of Washington, D.C., that has put our nation atop a $33 trillion debt that has led to, you know, $2 trillion annual deficits in our near future. Trying to convince I had, look, I have made no deal with Democrats because I believe that Democrats should vote against Kevin McCarthy for free. It's Kevin McCarthy who's out there offering deals to Democrats. So if there's a deal made with Democrats, the only deal is, is to make one with McCarthy. Because I'm not offering anything and won't offer anything. And by the way, you, if the Democrats want to own Kevin McCarthy, they can have it. Because one thing I'm at peace with is when we stand here uh, a week from now, I won't own Kevin McCarthy anymore. He won't, he won't belong to me. So if the Democrats want to adopt him, look, our number two is Steve Scalise. I think very highly of Steve Scalise. I would vote for Steve Scalise. I would probably vote for at least 100 Republicans in our caucus and maybe a hundred other Americans out there who wouldn't necessarily need to be a member of the body. Professor of Political Science at George Washington University, Sarah Binder, says that the U.S. narrowly dodged its fourth partial government shutdown in a decade, but the past week exposed the depths of political dysfunction in Washington especially within the splintered House Republican caucus. But the decision by Republican House of Representatives Speaker Kevin McCarthy to turn to Democrats to pass a short-term funding bill without further security aid to Ukraine pushed the risk of sh shutdown to mid-November, which means the federal government's more than 4 million workers can count on continued paychecks just for now. In response to this, headline Republican Representative Mark Gates a prominent holdout who had pushed for a deep spending cut said that he intends to move for McCarthy's ouster via a floor vote in the coming week. Majority in the House and Senate, Democrat and Republican. Well, to understand why there seemed to be this surprise turn of event, uh, turn of events yesterday, it's important to keep in mind the general dynamic that we're facing in Congress, which is, first of all, rising partisan polarization, an awful lot of just partisan team play. You can't, if you're the party leader, you can't give in two weeks before the deadline. You can't give in a week before the deadline. Seems you can give in a, some hours before the deadline, because if the speaker had turned to Democrats and said, let's just keep the government open for six weeks, let's do it together, let's buy us time, he would have been attacked, the speaker, by his far right, saying, why did you give in? If you had just held out, we could have got this draconian spending package. So in that sense, it makes a lot of sense. Deadlines are deadlines force action. And this deadline was a pretty tough one because Republicans really, most of them, did not want to shut the government down. Just moments ago on the House floor, we passed by overwhelming numbers the ability to keep government open for the next six weeks. Winston Churchill once said this about America. You can always count on Americans to do what's right after they exhausted every other option. I think the important part about yesterday's vote is it's just one vote. And it's just a stopgap measure to keep the government open for six weeks. And so there are several more votes that have to come because Congress and the president will have to fund the government for more than 45 days. I don't know that how, how much credit 
um, voters and Americans give to Congress for this sort of just in the nick of time? Well, we're used to stories about the wildfires in Australia, and don't get me wrong, I mean, it's still a big issue, even right now, but also on people's minds is the upcoming referendum on Indigenous rights standard for Sydney residents, with nearly voting now open in all states and all territories. Volunteers for both yes and no campaigns were seen giving out flyers outside voting centres as citizens entered to cast their ballots, while support for the referendum has begun to climb. According to a Guardian Essential poll, the majority of the voters still intend to vote no in the October 14th referendum. The spread of misinformation has contributed to lack of support for The Voice, according to political analysts and anti-misinformation experts. AAP Fact Check, which is a unit of the Australian Associated Press, has issued over 90 checks about the referendum, including the false claim that private property and housing will be threatened by the voice to parliament. Having had years of consultation with Aboriginal people, they came up with the Uluru Statement, which asked for a voice permanently in the Constitution so that what was best for them only could be discussed and given to government as ideas for government to act on. That's all it is. It's not about a land grab. It's not about having extra privilege or money. It's not about dividing the country. It's about pulling everyone together, using this as the basis, because that's what it is. It's the basis. Well, I'm very worried about what comes with the, uh, with the, whole, with the package. Uh, there's Noel Pearson, one of the advocates for the yes side, has said this is just, no, it's just the, the uh, um, voice is just the, the first door. So it's what else is behind the door that, that worries me a great deal. I think it brings with it a, almost a, a parliament uh, for a particular race, um, and it brings with it a, quite a big bureaucracy. Uh, I don't like to see the country divided according to race. I think we all should all be all equal Australians, equal uh, in every respect, and not have a special carve out for one particular race. I'm here today because I want to hand out these cards as I am concerned about if the voice were legislated to Parliament, there could be legal challenges where some Aboriginals could claim people's lands, like where people live, their houses, and it's not fair. And it could be dangerous for other legal challenges as well. We're just hundreds of years behind the rest of the planet, Australia. Marginalising the Indigenous people, putting them down, putting them in jail, locking them up destroying their education system. It's so embarrassing to be an Australian. Egypt Abdul Fattah al-Sisi wants to run for another term as president. It will be his third having been elected as Egypt's president in 2013 amid a mass protest against Muslim Brotherhood leader Mohamed Morsi. Activists in the country do not believe he deserves to run again as his presidency has been marked by a brutal suppression of all opposition and the collapse of the Egyptian economy. Al-Sisi will be allowed to run as the country's constitution was changed four years ago to prolong his time in office. And speaking of presidential bids, how about one Nobel Peace Prize winner's ambition to become president of the Democratic Republic of Congo, Dr. Dennis Mukwege? Mukwege won the award back in 2018, and on Monday, he addressed a crowd of jubilant supporters in the DRC capital, Kinshasa, telling them about his intentions. He criticized the current regime, but offered little proposals on solving the problems. He says that his only motivation is to save the homeland, to strengthen the country, straighten the country, and then restore dignity to the people of the DRC. The 68-year-old gynecologist says that he will give details of his program later. away from politics to nearby Niger, where 29 soldiers have been killed in an attack by armed jihadists near its border with Mali. The statement from the Nigerian Defense Ministry says, apart from the 29 soldiers killed in that attack, 
Two people have been seriously injured. However, it says that several dozen assailants were killed and vehicles were all destroyed in the process. The soldiers were said to have been returning from operations against the militants when they were targeted by over 100 assailants and vehicles and on motorbikes using explosive devices and suicide bombers. No group has declared responsibility, but this is considered one of the deadliest attacks since soldiers seized power in July of this year. We head to East Africa now, where Kenya is confident a multinational security force will soon be deployed in Haiti. And that's after the UN voted to back the East African nation's offer to lead the mission. Foreign Affairs Minister Alfred Mutua is now calling on international partners to help Kenya put together an effective multinational support mission that within a short time will be in Haiti. Late on Monday, the United Nations Security Council overwhelmingly approved the deployment of the Kenyan-led international force to help combat widespread gang violence in Haiti. But the resolution was approved with 13 votes in favor and two abstentions from China and from Russia. This mission comes at the request of the Haitian government and Haitian civil society to address the insecurity and dire humanitarian crisis the country has faced for far too long. The deployment of this mission will help to support Haiti's critical near-term needs and to foster the security conditions necessary for the country to advance long-term stability. The resolution makes clear the MSS mission will operate in strict compliance with international law and include dedicated expertise in anti-gang operations, community-oriented policing, children and women's protection, and preventing and responding to sexual and gender-based violence. The MSS mission must take necessary action to ensure appropriate conduct and discipline and to prevent sexual exploitation and abuse. Ecuador is the pen holder. Uh, let's bring in Kenyan journalist Cyrus Ombati from Nairobi. Thank you very much, Cyrus, for joining us on The World today. Thank you so much for having us, Mr. All right. Anyone who wants to ask, why is Kenya at the forefront of this multinational force? Well, that's the question everyone has been asking him or himself or herself because uh, it came as a surprise. But then I understand now, William Bruce, who is the current president of Kenya, is the blue eyed boy of a uh, the American region. Uh, and we believe Americans are approaching because they say they will fund the whole program. Uh, around 200 million dollars being given out for the whole exercise. Uh, so uh, Ruto said it's okay, you can take it up the, the, the whole thing. And uh, he says he's ready to send the, the troops to uh, Haiti end time uh, from January. Is there any other country uh, interested in this whole multinational force? Other countries that have indicated interest in being part of it? Yeah, they say that uh, countries like the Dominican Republic, uh, the Bahamas, Jamaica, or other the, the countries surrounding the Haiti itself, they are now ready to support the whole program. There are around 10 countries which have pledged support in terms of troops. Uh, Apart from the Kenyan troops, which will be around a thousand troops from Kenya, the rest will be filled by other countries, most of them which are in the, the near Haiti itself now. Well, when we consider the economy or even funding across countries in Africa, anyone would want to ask where will the funding for the special mission come from? As I said earlier, it's American, which is America government is the one which is going to fund the whole program. In fact, uh, last week, uh, Mr. The, the Secretary of Defense, Mr. Lloyd Brown, was here in Kenya, and he said that they are going to, Lloyd was host, he said they are going to give 100 million US dollars. Then earlier on, uh, Ms. Blinken, the Secretary of State, had also said they are going to give 100 million dollars for the same program for logistics, intelligence, and all those programs that were. So, in total, America did for this guy to give almost a uh, Two hundred million dollars. That's 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 more than enough for any plan for such exercise. Because you know, we provide vehicles, uh, the kids for the, the police officers who are to join this program, uh, food, all those. 
call, you, you can call it either food, uh, delta, uh, salaries. They are the ones funding the, the whole program. And when is the force expected to be on ground in Haiti? How long do you think this whole mission would last? Uh, well, we well, understand now after this uh, uh, kind of approval by the UN Security Council, the Kenyan National Security Council also met yesterday and approved the whole thing. Now the next program will be going to taking the whole thing to Parliament, which is expected actually to vote on the overwhelmingly. And uh, from there, it's just uh, compiling the whole thing, uh, teaching them. And according to the Foreign Affairs Minister, Mr. Mutua, by January, probably January uh, next year, the troops will be going to Haiti. Maybe January or December, they are in time for now. They are ready to for that mission. All right. Thank you very much. Kenyan journalist Cyrus Sombati from Nairobi, Kenya. We're we'll keeping tabs on that story as it develops. Thanks a lot for your contribution on the world today. To other stories now, security forces in Turkey have detained nearly 90 people across the country overnight over suspected links to the outlawed Kurdistan Workers' Party just two days after a bomb attack in Ankara claimed by the militant group. Interior Minister Ali Yerlekia also says that 466 operations have been carried out against intelligence units of Kurdish militant group, the PKK, across the country. On Sunday, two attacks detonated, two attackers detonated a bomb near government buildings in Ankara, killing them both and then wounding two police officers. The PKK militant group designated a terrorist organization by Turkey, the United States and the European Union claimed responsibility for that attack. But Turkey subsequently carried out airstrikes on militant targets in northern Iraq and then detained suspects in Istanbul overnight just hours after the PKK made its claim of responsibility. Welcome back. The World Health Organization has recommended the use of a second malaria vaccine to curb the life-threatening spread of the disease to humans by mosquitoes. WHO Chief Tedros Gabriesus told a briefing in Geneva that R21 Matrix M, developed by Britain's University of Oxford, will be rolled out in some African countries in early 2024 and will be available by mid-2024 in other countries. Doses will cost, cost between two and four U.S. dollars. It gives me great pleasure to announce that WHO is recommending a second vaccine called R21 Metrics M to prevent malaria in children at risk of the disease in areas with seasonal transmission. It reduced symptomatic cases of malaria by 75% in the 12 months following a three-dose series of the vaccine. At a cost of between two and four US dollars a dose, it's comparable with other recommended malaria interventions and other childhood vaccines. The course department, and uh, next to Dr. O'Brien, is Dr. We had mentioned a few weather events earlier in the show, and we have more reports now. Let's begin with Taiwan, where a land warning has been issued ahead of the arrival of Typhoon Koenu, which is expected to bring heavy rain and winds to large parts of the island's south and eastern regions. Authorities say the heaviest rain will fall around mountainous and sparsely populated parts in Potung County in the south and the east coast counties of Taitung and Hualien. Some local businesses have been slowly closing down since Monday, and access to most beaches along the island's southeast coast have been shut off in anticipation of the typhoon. While some flights and ferries to outlying, um, outlying Taiwanese islands have also been cancelled by wind builds. Tropical Storm Risk says the typhoon, now a Category 3 storm, is likely to weaken to a Category 2 at the time, it makes landfall on Taiwan's far southeast coast late on Wednesday, October the 4th. And for 128 years, one of U.S.'s oldest mummies have been on display at a local funeral home in the small city of Reading in Pennsylvania. But that will soon change as the funeral home prepares a proper send-off and a burial for the unidentified man known to locals as Stone Man Willie. 
Well, since his death on November the 19th, 1895, Almond's funeral home has displayed the remains of a petty thief who died of kidney failure in a local jail and was accidentally mummified by a Mortican experimenting with their embalming, embalming techniques. But because he gave authorities a fictitious name upon his arrest, Stoneman Willie's true identity remained hidden. Local officials were unable to locate his relatives. The funeral home had initially tried to embalm him while they searched for a next of kin. Eventually, petitioned the state for permission to keep the body instead of burying it, since uh, saying that they wanted to monitor the experimental embalming process. I never dreamed I would, you know, when I was a kid growing up, he was a sideshow freak that people craved to go see. I saw Stone Man Willie, you know, and I, when I first saw him, I, I came out saying, I saw Stone Man Willie. Now to be a part of the laying to rest, and I'm, you, you use the word man, I'm very, very particular about that in my eulogy. He was a man, and he was not Stone. His name was not Willie, but he became a legend which is fine, I'm very much into legends. But he was a man. He had a mother and a father, friends and relatives we know nothing about. And I think that's the important thing for the eulogy of what we know as Stone Man Willie. We love it, it's, it's, it's the roots, it's here, it's where we're from, and it's, it's a generational thing. And not so much my generation, um, but my parents and grandparents, they have memories of coming into town and visiting Stone Man Willie, so. Who do you? Enough, Anna. No, why? Why do you shut me out? Why, why do you shut the world out? What are you so afraid of? I said enough! Well, London Landmarks today got the icy treatment as Disney celebrated the 10th year anniversary of Frozen. A Piccadilly Circus Black Taxi and Classic Red Phone Box in Leicester Square were giving a winter wonderland transformation to honor the Oscar winning film. Frozen tells the story of two orphaned royal sisters when their kingdom became trapped in an eternal winter unintentionally caused by Snow Queen Elsa voiced by Edina Menzel, younger sister Anna, Christine Bell, voiced their part, joins Montania Kristoff, who's Jonathan Groff, his reindeer, and the magical snowman Olaf, who's Josh Gad, to find Elsa, break her spell, and then rekindle their relationship. Disney was praised for keeping up with modern times by prioritizing the themes of sisterhood and self-discovery versus the traditional model of having a prince doing the rescuing, according to Disney's press release. I don't know. I mean, my daughter was about, I think, four when it came out. I remember I went to see it three times at the cinema. Um, I think the music was amazing. I think the graphics were amazing, and it just really captured, the, particularly that generation. She had frozen parties left, right, and centre, all of her age group, and it just sort of... The music was fantastic. I think it just sort of captured their imagination. And then it's obviously survived. I don't know what it is. There's something special about Frozen. It's just the most magical film. I think it's the music, the characters. Um, there's lots of humour in it. And just the kind of, yeah, like the sparkle and the magic, magical, like magical aspect of it. I think it just kind of won the hearts of so many children um, and adults when it, when it was released 10 years ago. And it's still is amazing now and it proves because obviously I've just had a baby and he's now obsessed with the film so it doesn't look like it's ever going to go away. And I remember my husband famously sitting on an aeroplane like singing singing along to let it go and everyone kind of wondering what is happening. Uh, so yeah it was, a, it was a big moment for us as well. Well it's no surprise Frozen is one movie or film that has won the hearts of both children and adults. So let's let it go right now on the show. But thank you so much for watching and staying with us on the world today. Thank you. I'm Anne Wawadu. Stay safe.